The NBA offseason is quickly approaching. You have the draft lottery right around the corner. And then right after the playoffs end, pretty much, right into the draft, right into free agency. It feels like the NBA never stops. And so from a Kings perspective, going into this offseason, I am very excited. And I'm really excited because the Kings have a draft pick, a lottery pick in this draft. They have other draft capital to use. And they have some other ways to go about improving this team. This past season, you know, I think it was a bit of a disappointment, but I also think that progress has been made. And in Bobby Mark's off-season preview for the Kings, I thought he posed a good question, which was, has this Kings roster plateaued? And now, I feel like in some ways the answer is yes, and in some ways the answer is no. I've said it a million times and I'll say it again. I think this team is going to go as far as Keegan Murray takes it. And so this team still has young players and especially Keegan Murray that can get better and can improve this team. And so from that perspective, no, I don't think they've plateaued. But I do think when you're looking at this core, unless Keegan Murray becomes like, you know, superstar level, which, you know, you, you can't really expect that. I'm more expecting 20 point per game scorer plus great defender. So when I think you're looking at the core with De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Keegan Murray, and then the big question is Malik Monk, but with those guys, plus some of the other young talent you have on this team, I think maybe the ceiling you could say is Western Conference Finals, if everything falls right. And that's maybe within the next two seasons. And if everything falls right, matchups fall right, young players are developing, you don't really have injuries. But I don't think this team can just sit back and wait for two, three years and expect for a championship to just fall in their laps. Like, that's just not going to happen. I mean, that's just never really been the case for any team, uh, except for, you know, a select few teams that just draft really, really well. And so I do think there will have to be a a move made at some point to kind of either add to the Kings core and add a top player or, you know, mix it up at some point, trading a core player. I think people are, are pretty impatient. Like there were people the very first season this team was good. Why didn't the team make a move at the trade deadline? You only got Kessler Edwards. You know, it's like people are very impatient, even during the first good season in 16 seasons, people are impatient. And so now that we're kind of two years into it, obviously people want to see progress. And when you go from making the playoffs to not making the playoffs, it's going to upset people. And that's understandable. And I think the Kings are always going to be in the trade market. They'll always be exploring things with the the draft capital that they have and some of the contracts that they have. And So until they make a move, they're always going to be rumored with players. Any player that comes along and is upset with their team or is being shot by their team, you know, a Brandon Ingram, a Zach Levine, those type of guys, you're always going to hear the King's name mentioned with them. But I'm here to say if you have big expectations for this offseason thinking this has to be the time where the Kings make a move, I'm just I'm here to tell you to like settle down a little bit because I really don't expect a big move from the Kings this offseason. I think if you were going to see them really try to make a move, it was going to be last season when they had cap space and they probably did try to sign a player like Kyle Kuzma who just wanted to stay in Washington or, you know, another player like Jeremy Grant, but he just got his big deal with Portland. This front office has shown that it is willing to make a big move and a risky move, but they're going to be patient. And I I think when you look at the contracts that the Kings have, which we'll get to a little later, I just think they have a little bit of time before they make that move. But obviously the big focus of this offseason for the Kings revolves around Malik Monk. Malik Monk, who was arguably the Kings' third best player, third, fourth, right there with Keegan Murray, right? Coming off the bench, should have been sixth man of the year. He's a free agent, and the Kings only have early bird rights and not bird rights. And so what that means is they can offer him around four years, $78 million about. 
And so that's right on the line of being a little bit scary, where another team could come along and offer a little bit more. And so you have teams like the Orlando Magic or the Philadelphia 76ers to some extent or the Pistons. But I personally just am not that worried about the the teams that other people are worried about. Like the Magic a little bit, I'm worried. But I think from a Kings fan's perspective, I think every fan base overrates their players a little bit. And so maybe that means in a good sense, we're overrating Malik Monk a little bit. So we think he should get paid more than he will and that other teams are willing to offer him. And so maybe that's a good thing. And he wants to be in Sacramento. Obviously, it's not great with like the income taxes. And so that all that hurts our chances a bit, you know, from a a financial standpoint, I do think he'll take a little bit of a pay cut to stay here, but money talks. And so he could leave. But I'm just not sure what team is going to be willing to offer him 25 million a year or around that. I'm just not so sure it's going to happen. I think where I'm a little bit nervous is some team coming along and doing the Bruce Brown or or the Fred Van Vliet, where they have to get over the salary floor. And so they just offer him a, a two year deal. That's an insane amount of money that he just can't turn down. That's I think the biggest worry is some team that's just looking to get over that salary floor, and maybe even looking to use him that like that contract as a trade asset in the future and not really thinking long term with him, which would really suck. But I am leaning towards him staying like I I feel like he will. But whether he stays or goes kind of changes what the Kings do this offseason quite a bit. Because I think really where the Kings are struggling right now as a team, I think on the defensive end, you look at wing size. And so Malik Monk's not really affecting that. We need size on the wing, defensive size. Uh, but on the offensive side, this team, even with Malik Monk, lacked shot creation. And so obviously you're hoping a little bit uh, for Keegan Murray to take a jump, but you still need more. And so if you lose Malik Monk, then you're losing a player in an area where you already were struggling a bit. And so I feel like if that happens, then the Kings are going to need to make some moves to account for that loss. Whereas I think if he stays, then the Kings are going to be a little more okay of just writing things out and not going for big moves this offseason. And so when you look at the Kings uh, contracts right now, you have Barnes and Herder who have two more years on their deals. You have Fox and Keegan uh, who have two more years until their extensions. Uh, and Fox probably won't extend this offseason uh, because he can make a whole lot more money if next season he makes all NBA and then signs his extension. And that's if he doesn't make all NBA this season, but that's not going to happen. So he's, he's not making all NBA. Right now, no backup centers under contract. JaVale McGee and Alex Len both free agents. I hope we bring Alex Len back. But that could be an area where I think the Kings will definitely look to bring someone in there uh, on a small deal. I don't think they'll really spend a lot of their money that they have on that. And maybe that's where the draft pick goes. That's very possible. At least someone with like a, a four or five, someone that can play with Sabonis maybe. Kessler Edwards is a restricted free agent. I would like to see him back. Uh, I think he's shown some promise. But I think really what you're looking at with the Kings is this two-year timeline where Barnes and Herter are on those two-year deals. You also have Keon on a two-year deal as well. Uh, and Fox and Keegan, two years until extensions. And so that's that's a big point for the Kings. And I think when you look back, it's kind of in a little bit of a way, it's similar to when Harrison Barnes was coming to the end of his deal. He had one and a half years left when that uh, Sabonis trade happened. And so when obviously Harrison Barnes was playing really well at that time, and it was a little bit scary of like, after one full season of having this team with Sabonis and others together, we could lose Harrison Barnes, like that could be bad. And so that's why the move was made at that point. And so I think you'll see something similar here where the Kings have this two-year kind of window to make something happen. Either trading those Barnes and Herder contracts 
or you're looking at once those extensions happen at that two year mark, then the Kings are in a little bit of salary cap trouble probably. And so that maybe makes things a little bit difficult. You know, you don't want to let guys walk, but you can't really spend money if you don't think that the core is going to make it happen. And so that's going to be the all in point of the team. And Vivek is going to have to decide, like, is he willing to spend on this core? And so it's not really going to be this offseason, but it's going to be these next two, I think. If the Kings do end up signing Malik Monk to that four-year $78 million deal, then I believe they will be over the first apron and slightly into the luxury tax, which isn't that big of a deal. But then, you know, at that point, you're kind of locked into the deals that you have. Uh, and this season, they do have some other tools to work with, though, in the mid-level exception and the biannual exception, which they didn't use last season. And so for right now, while they're under that apron, they have both of those tools to use to their fullest extent. But I do think this will be a quiet off season for the most part, and the Kings are just going to look for team continuity again. And I know that's going to be frustrating for some people, but I really don't think it's that big of a deal if you go into next season with you know Harrison Barnes still starting at the four because you saw defensive strides. We'll see if that those defensive strides and physicality translate into next season, and you got to figure out the offense a little bit but you're relying on the growth of Keegan Murray and company. And there's really right now not a need to rush. It's all about maintaining flexibility. Like you don't want to handicap yourself like a team like the Phoenix Suns did. Because if you do and it doesn't work out and you get swept in the first round by the Minnesota Timberwolves and you have Bradley Beal who has a no trade clause and three more years on his massive deal, what are you going to do? And so... You don't want the Kings to be in that situation with a core that can't make it all the way. And so you have to be patient and maintain flexibility until you are confident enough to go all in. And so that's why the Kings are going to continue to monitor until the right player becomes available. And then they go all in for that player. But like I said, the available tools that the Kings have, mid-level exception, biannual exception, uh, the draft, which I'm super excited about, the team needs defensive wing size, maybe someone that can play next to Sabonis who can also stretch the floor. That would be ideal. Uh, and maybe that's who they target in the draft. I would love that. I'm not a draft expert. I've been hearing good things about Dayron Holmes. That could be a guy that kind of fills that need. But then the Kings also need shot creation. And I think you have kind of question marks around the likes of Davion Mitchell and Kevin Herter and what they're going to provide coming off interesting seasons. Her Herter probably his worst season, maybe of his career, but willing to give him the benefit of the doubt for now because he's been consistent otherwise, other than this last season. And he, you know, had the injury to end the season. Davion, though, super inconsistent, but great end to the season. And so it's like, do you want to keep rolling? with those guys. I'm not so sure, you know, it's I'm not super confident in either of those guys, but if Malik Monk does leave, then you need more shot creation, so those guys would need to step up, but you also need to look into free agency probably to address that need. It was kind of interesting. I saw a Bleacher report. Uh, I think it was an Instagram post where they were they just had like random guys that are on the trade block possibly and they're the best fit and the worst fit. And the first one was like Kevin Durant. And I'm like, the worst fit is so stupid. He fits everywhere. And, you know, the next one was also stupid about the worst fit. I'm like, worst fit? What are you talking about? And then I, I scroll one more. And it's Zach Levine. Worst fit to Sacramento. And I'm just like, you know, just a little bit of a side tangent here. Uh, wh wh You're just showing that you don't watch the Kings if you think Zach Levine is the worst fit in the league on the Kings. I think that's just showing that it's like, it's like if a TV show is on, they like, they air it on live TV, right? So some people are keeping up there, but some people don't want to watch that. And some people want to wait until it's on Netflix, it's on streaming, right? And so then, and then they can just like whip through it real quick and binge watch it. I feel like that's kind of what small market NBA teams are a lot of times to these you know, national media people is with the big teams, they'll watch them live, you know, 
they'll they'll watch the Lakers and the Warriors because they're always on national television. And then with the small market teams, they're always like a year behind. They're a season behind, right? It's like last season, yeah, shot creation wasn't what we needed, but now it is. Now it is. We need a score. And so I think Zach Levine would actually be a good fit, not taking his contract into account, but just saying that Zach Levine's worst fit is in Sacramento. I just think that's kind of stupid. So the mid-level exception, I believe, is around $12 million, and the biannual is $4 million, I think I have that right. Yeah, so I looked it up here. The non-taxpayer mid-level, which is what the Kings would be uh, as long as they do it before they would sign the likes of Malik Monk, is about $13 million, and the uh, biannual is $4.5 million. And I believe those, or at least the mid-level, I think with both of them, you can use them in trades, like you can trade into those exceptions uh, for contracts. And so just defensive wing, defensive wing, defensive wing. Najee Marshall would love a guy like that. So just some defensive wing. We just need it so badly. And as we get closer to free agency, I'll go through more names. Uh, but right now, you know, there's still a lot to be seen. But then, yeah, a guy like uh, like Lonnie Walker. It's always interesting. And just someone who can go get a bucket. I think the loss of Terrence Davis probably wasn't talked about enough. Just a guy off the bench who can go get you a bucket like that is really important. And Chris Duarte didn't fill that need. And so I think uh, they definitely need to target someone there. But now let's talk about the draft. Because this is the thing that I'm most excited about. The draft lottery coming up pretty soon. Maybe it's already happened uh, when you're watching this. Kings, I believe, have a 0.8% chance of getting the first overall pick. And, I, you know, a very low chance to jump to top four, something like that. You get the idea. It's it's not going to happen. But if it does, like, we're going to the championship. You know, if we get Alex Saar, pair him next to Sabonis, ooh, that would be nice. But no, that's not going to happen. So most likely, we'll have the 13th overall pick. And I am very, very excited for that because just looking at the NBA as a whole, the reason draft picks are valuable, especially for good teams, is really because with the way the CBA is, once you get good and you're locked into your players and their big old contracts, then it becomes very hard to sign players. And so it's really important that you draft well to fill out your rotation. That's really why draft picks are so important in terms of trade. Because when you trade for a draft pick, it's normally not going to be a high draft pick. And so draft picks are more about getting those value guys than getting the top guys, I think. And so that's why I think in a way people also overrate draft picks is because they think of it as those top 10 picks or lottery picks when most of the time when they're traded, it isn't those picks. And I mean, you can see it here. The Hawks are not getting this 13th overall pick. And there have been a lot of people who are like, you think the Hawks just want to take it so then we can free up picks down the road? But I'm like, no, we want to use this 13th overall pick. It's valuable now. Getting a good player here at 13 could be huge. And I think, you know, despite it being a weak draft, past the top five, it's going to be pretty similar to every other draft. Maybe past the top 10, we can still find someone good here and of value. And at the end of the day in the NBA, I think, I mean, good young players are more valuable than draft picks. And I think you saw that with Toronto, where to trade um, OG and an OB, they want RJ Barrett. They want Emmanuel quickly. They don't want a whole bunch of draft picks. And so I feel like it's kind of been undersold how important this 13th, uh, 13th pick is for the Kings. And the Kings hopefully will not be picking this high in years to come hopefully they'll be in the 20s and hopefully the hawks get a pick in the 20s right the front office wouldn't have protected the pick when they traded it for kevin herter if they didn't want to use it if it was a lottery pick and if we want to eventually you know go all in and get a very good player we have to have young players to be able to package with picks to send out probably and so if we could draft a good young player and then have some other good young up-and-coming players like a Colby Jones and a Keon Ellis. I know everyone loves Keon right now, and I do too, but like you have to give up players to get players. And so at some point, like having young talent becomes very important for those trades. 
even if it is just based on potential. Looking at a list of guys that have been uh, drafted with the 13th overall pick, Zach Levine, Devin Booker, Donovan Mitchell, and in between all those guys, Yorgos Papayanis. So, you know, Tyler Hero, Chris Duarte, uh, Jalen Duran. And so, you know, obviously it's not going to be always good, but you can absolutely get talent. And so I would absolutely love a stretch big shot blocker. You know, I mentioned the name Dayron Holmes earlier. Again, I'm not I'm not a big draft expert, but that's just been a name that I've heard that seems to fit that bill. You could also just go best player available, the guy that you think has the most talent. And then, like I said, later on, if he doesn't fit, well, guess what? He'll be used in a trade. Uh, you know, a guy who can come off the bench and get a bucket, you could always use some of those. And so I'm just, I'm so, so excited for the draft. And who knows, maybe on draft night, we trade the pick and then we get someone good. And that could be good as well. You never know. So that's pretty much it for this episode of the Roll Report. I'm very excited for this offseason, but I, I, you know, I got to keep reiterating, I don't think a big move is coming this offseason. I think it's about working around the edges and maintaining flexibility for now. And we kind of got this two-year window to work with before going all in. But you never know. Maybe on draft night, the big trade happens. So I think there's always excitement going into the offseason. I know I'm very excited. And so if any more news breaks regarding the Kings, I will be right back here to talk about it. Make sure to subscribe. Hit the notification bell if you're on YouTube to know when I've uploaded. And I will see you guys later. Peace.